Good morning, good morning. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chris. It's always a pleasure to be back at Sojourn Church. I, I love this church. I love the spirit here. Great to see so many folks that I know. But it's also great to see a lot of folks I don't know. That's a sign that you're not only continuing to grow spiritually, but also numerically. And, and that's, that's a sign of the Lord's presence with you and on uh, your leadership through Pastor Chris. I'm delighted to be back. Yes, the Braves won last night. I make absolutely no prediction about anything concerning the Braves and the Dodgers. It, except for the grace of God, we will not win this series from the Dodgers. They are a formidable team, but God loves the Braves. <laughs> I mean, God, the Word of God calls us to be brave. Doesn't say anything about dodging stuff. Dodging is not in the Bible. Dodging feels like cheating somehow. I don't know. But we won last night. I'm going to rejoice in that one. I would like us to get like a nine-run lead. This win by a single hit in the bottom of the ninth, I'm, I'm just too old for this stuff. I, we got we to get ahead of these boys. Well, it's great to be here. I, um, I have premiered several books here in the past, and I, I have a brand new book today. I'm not going to speak on this book, which I usually do when I bring a new book, but I do have the book here, and I hope that you will get it, uh, that I don't have to preach on it for you to buy it. So it is here. This uh, book is called Of Kings and Prophets. It really deals with the interaction between the Old Testament prophets and the kings that they confronted. Uh, but the underlying issue of the book is the intersection between supernatural authority and secular power. There could hardly be a book more timely given the current political atmosphere in which we find ourselves. There are fake kings. Uh, a fake king is a, a general title for people who think they're in some kind of power and they're not really. Um, they're fake kings. Jo um, Herod the Great was a fake king. He wasn't even a Jew. He was the king of Israel, but he was an Idumean. He wasn't even a Jew. He was appointed as the king of Israel by, um, by uh, Caesar. So he was a puppet. He wasn't even a real king. So there are fake kings. But there are also false prophets. Zedekiah was a false prophet. Um, between the two, a false prophet is much more dangerous than a fake king. So I hope you'll get the book. I hope you'll enjoy it. We have it. I also have the last book here, David the Great. This was a huge seller for us. It, it exploded. And we sold a lot of them at this church. So a lot of you may have already read David the Great. This, uh, this was tremendous for us. And I... I this, it's not exactly part one and part two, but this is a natural subsequent book to David the Great. So I think of those as a, as a part one and part two. We also have both books out here in Spanish, David el Grande y de Reyes y Profetas. So I hope that um, if you need it in English or in La Lengua Celestial, los tenemos. All right, so... You probably don't need to hear this. It doesn't matter to you to hear it. It matters to me to say it. I do not take one penny for speaking anywhere, preaching. I've never taken an honorarium, a love offering, all the times I've ever been at this church. I don't take any pen, anything. Not one penny. It's never. All the book sales, this is my 20th book. All those sales worldwide, even the royalty checks from the publisher, they never touch my hands. They go 100% to the missions program at Global Servants, particularly our girls' homes. House of Grace, we have one in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, and one in Africa, in Ghana. And all that you spend on these books goes 100% to support those little girls. So I hope that you will go out there to the book table and spend yourself into bankruptcy. <laughs> that you will leave here broke in desperate need, <laughs> refinance your house, <laughs> take the children's lunch money, come on. I hope you'll enjoy the books and that they'll be a blessing to you. Christmas is coming. 
you can fill up your entire Christmas list today. And uh, the uh, pastor asked if I would go out to the lobby and sign books after the service is over. I will. Uh, while he closes the service, I'll go out to the lobby and sign books. My signature in your book makes it used and therefore worthless. <laughs> you buy a thousand of them, I'll sign them all. Somebody asked me one time if my hand ever got tired of signing books. Never, never. My hand gets tired of signing checks. It'll, sometimes, after a couple of checks, I can't even hold the pen. That's, all right, well, you're in a jolly mood today. I like this. You can't believe the churches where I go where laughter has never touched that face. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, please, to the gospel as John records it. I'm going to uh, read a passage from the very first chapter of John, and then we'll turn to the 10th chapter. So John chapter 1, I want to read the first four verses of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Look at verse 4 again. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now turn to chapter 10, if you will. And if you have a a red letter Bible, you'll notice that now we're going to be reading red letters. That means Jesus himself is speaking. So John chapter 1, the first chapter of John, is largely John's narrative introduction to his gospel of Jesus. But this is now Jesus himself speaking. It's in the context of a lot of other things he's saying, but it's the natural follow-up on the issue of life that John speaks about in the first four verses. John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus is speaking. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and mercy usward, generation after generation, that you never abandon us to our own devices. Thank you, God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Now, Lord, I pray that you will brush aside every barrier to divine communication. Rush in over the threshold of our souls and speak to us deep within. That when we leave here today, we will say one to another, surely the Lord has spoken unto us. In Jesus' name, the strong Son of God. Amen. Amen and amen. I have devoted the major portion of my adult life uh, to the study of communication. I'm intrigued with it. What makes communication work? When it works, what, what causes it? When it goes south, what happened? Um, I, I'm fascinated with it. I, I believe that we're one to boil the entire discipline of communication for a thousand years. The, the cream, the creme de sens that would rise to the top is really just four things. You can describe the entire discipline of communication with four things. The right message to the right party in the right way at the right time. If you get any of those four variables wrong, it can all go wrong, really wrong, really fast. You can think that you are transmitting clearly and, and the whole thing goes south. Uh, every married man in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about right now. There are times when you think that you are saying exactly the right thing and you can tell by the look on her face that while you're talking, the ice is cracking under your feet. <laughs> the, the, the issue of communication is so complicated by language, by culture, uh, words that mean different things in different places. It can be complicated by generational transition. Words are changing so fast. The English language, part of that is technology, is causing English to just shift so quickly that, that words that meant one thing just a few years ago mean something else completely different now. Uh, I see a lot of young people here. I prophesy to you that their words which you use now, if, you, if Jesus tarries and you live so long as I have, 
that when you're my age, you may still use those words, but they may mean something entirely different than, than what they meant when you were young. I wonder if there's anybody here, I'm probably the oldest person in the room, but I wonder if there's anybody here that can remember when gay meant happy. Does anybody remember that? I, I want gay back. <laughs> Who stole gay? When I was a kid, gay had nothing to do with orientation. It was about disposition. I, I'd go to a party and come home. My mom would say, how was the party? I'd say, it was great. Everybody there was gay. <laughs> she wasn't worried. We, we were just happy. Rem, remember the Christmas song? You remember the Christmas song, Don We Now, Our Gay Apparel? That doesn't mean Christmas and drag. <laughs> it just means we're happy about the birth of Christ. It can, it, can happen, uh, it can happen simply from the way people hear you can mess up communication. I have a really good friend. He's an old dude like me, and he, he played college basketball at a small college in South Georgia. Anybody here ever heard of ABAC, Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College in South Georgia? And uh, so it was one of those schools that a lot of guys came from all over to play basketball. They weren't really interested in an agricultural degree, but they wanted a free college education by playing basketball. So they used to have great basketball teams at this little ABAC college. My friend played there, and he said that the coach was a sincere and dedicated Christian in the Pentecostal holiness denomination. And he decided one night to take the whole team that we're going to have a revival at his church. And he took the team for the first night and they all agreed to go. A lot of them weren't really Christian boys. And one kid from the Bronx had never been in a church, never been in a church his whole life. The preacher seeing this line of college students, his his appetite just got away from him. He, I mean, he said, this, this is what he's dreamed of, you know, a, a whole row of basketball players. And so he lowered the guns to deck level and loaded the grape shot. But he wasn't getting the response from these basketball players that he wanted or thought he wanted. So he leaped off of the platform and ran out there. The boy from the Bronx was right on the end of the pew. And he pointed in the boy's face and said, what about you, son? Are you a sinner? Are you a sinner? And the boy said, no, sir, I'm a guard. <laughs> you can think you're communicating clearly. <laughs> now that all brings to mind, what is the communication problem of God? I know what you're thinking. God has no problems, but he does. The transmitter is perfect. The transmission is perfect. All the receivers are broken. Every transmission usward from God has to be received through the filter of our own fallen and carnal humanity. So God is constantly speaking to us, but we, we receive it garbled. The Bible speaks to this. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God who in various times and diverse manners, so it God who in the past, in different ways, God who in various times and diverse manners, hath spoken unto us through his prophets, whom we despised, rejected, even killed. God who in various times and diverse manners hath spoken unto us through his prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us through his Son, through the Word. That is exactly the theme that John picks up on in his opening narrative to the Gospel of John. He says, and the word, the communication, the pre-existent communication of God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the historical communication of the pre-existent co-eternal thought of God, the communication of God. So before there was light, God thought inside himself and that communication, everything that is created, that's what we just read, everything that was made was made and without him, none of it was made because light was not made by the fingers of God. It was what? Communicated by God. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God spoke into existence. Therefore, the word of God was pre-creation, 
pre-existent, co-eternal, second person of the Trinity. Now, God says, they've rejected my prophets. They can't hear what I'm saying. So I'm going to have to send them the divine, perfect communication. And the word became flesh. He spoke the word into the womb of a virgin girl. And that word, taking root with her, became Jesus of Nazareth. And that baby was born, the pre-existent, co-eternal, second person of the Trinity, the divine communication. Now, the answer to our need for redemption was the coming of Jesus. He had to be a real human being because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So he couldn't be an idea, a theological construct, an angel could not bring the divine perfect message of our redemption because an angel can't bleed. It had to be a real human being who could bleed. If Jesus had lived to be 100 years old and died in a nursing home of pneumonia in Jerusalem somewhere, we're all going to hell because he had to die a blood death. But in order to die a blood death, he had to be a real human being. But there is the problem. If he was a real human being, he looked real. See, Jesus didn't glow in the dark. If Jesus had walked into every room three feet off of the ground with shafts of purple light coming out from under his fingernails and new age music playing in the background, people would have said, I don't know, I'm just guessing here, Messiah. But the problem was he looked like everybody else. He wasn't even handsome. The, you, the Hollywood has never, re- has never read the Bible because the book of Isaiah says he was not comely, handsome. He was not handsome that anybody would want to look at him. But you will never see a Hollywood movie with an ugly Jesus. I'm thinking about making it the title of my next book, The, the God of the Ugly. Jesus was a real human being ordinary looking, if not ugly, at least ordinary, just an ordinary guy. But we don't like that human thing. We want to think about the devil. We want to think about him casting out demons and walking on water, but we don't want to think about the humanity of Christ. That's, that's why we tidy it up all the time. Think about the, the birth of Jesus. You'll, you never see Christmas cards that aren't tidied up. They all celebrate the, the, the divine nature of that baby. You, you see these classical paintings where the holy family is coming into Bethlehem and they all have halos. Joseph has a halo. Mary has a halo. Got a halo over her tummy. Donkey's got halo over each ears. And we think that people looked out of their windows and saw the holy family coming down the street with halos. Luke chapter 2. But they had no halos. Luke tells us. They had, it says in the Gospel of Luke, and they had no halos. Well, that's not the way Luke says it. But it's what he means. What he says is, and there was no room for them at the inn. That means they had no halos. Somebody shows up at your hotel with a halo, you just find him a room. You go down to the poor sucker in 119 and say, I'm sorry, sport, you're out. These people have halos. What you don't do is put people with halos in the garage. They just look like everybody else. Now, let me shock you with this. There was nothing miraculous about the birth of Jesus. There was nothing miraculous, except to the extent that the birth of every baby is miraculous in a sense. But there was nothing uniquely miraculous about the birth of Jesus. It was a Regular birth, just like every other birth, with all of the pain and the fluid and, the, and everything else. A lonely girl having a baby in a cattle stall whose, whose fiancé is the only midwife she's got. That, that's the, the whole story. There was nothing miraculous about the birth of Jesus. The conception was miraculous, but the birth was not. The baby that was born was a real baby. But we don't like that. Remember the Christmas song? What is it? Away in the manger, I think. Little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The cattle are lowing. The baby awakes. The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Sup with that. (laughs) 
baby Jesus couldn't cry. He didn't have like tear ducts and everything. Why, do, why is that in that song? It's because we don't like the totally human idea of the little Lord Jesus laying there squalling his brains out. But the baby Jesus could cry. How many of you had kids? Can I see that? Did yours crying they made? Mine crying they made. All night crying they made. I cherish the idea of Joseph pacing up and down in his cattle stall at three in the morning saying, oh God, I'm not asking you to make him the Messiah, just make him sleep. <laughs> Let me tell you something else. I'm an equal opportunity preacher. I want to offend you all. So if I haven't done it so far, try this. N not only did Jesus crying he made, he made everything else babies make. Put that on a Christmas card. But that's important. That's theologically important. Because if that's not true, then he wasn't a real human and he cannot identify with us at our most defenseless and filthiest worst when we need someone else to clean us up. Jesus was a real baby. Now, like all babies, human babies are not self-aware. No baby is lying there thinking to himself, I'm a baby. Of course, someday I'll get grown, but right now I'm a baby. <laughs> he, is, he is entirely imprisoned in his own infancy. Okay? So the baby Jesus is a real baby. When they put that baby to Mary's breast, he's not lying there thinking, I'm the pre-existent, co-eternal, second person of the Trinity. <laughs> he's just looking for milk. But the Bible says he grew in favor with man and with God. In other words, he grew into self-awareness of himself as a human being. All people begin to be aware of themselves as human beings. They become self-aware. For some, that happens slower than others. Those of you that are the parents of junior high school boys, you're worrying. But, but gradually, we all become aware of ourselves as humans. But this little human is also becoming aware of himself as the pre-existent, co-eternal, second person of the Trinity. He is the divine communication of God. So he is remembering his pre-existence with God as God. And therefore, he is thinking in God. He's thinking in the divine language of God, which is what? What is the language of God? When God said, let us make man in our own image. What language was he speaking? He wasn't talking to angels. We're not made in the image of angels. When he said, let us make man in our own image, he was speaking inside himself. In the enclosed society of the divine Godhead, God the Father, through the word, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to himself, within himself. Let us, the, the triune God, make God Make man in our own image. In what language was he speaking when he said that? The language of God is God. The problem is we no longer speak God. We, we, we can't even speak to each other. We can't even commute, let alone speak God. We used to. When Adam and God walked together and talked together in the cool of the evening, they weren't speaking English. They were talking in God. But after the exile from the Garden of Eden, humanity could no longer speak God. After the Tower of Babel, we could no longer talk to each other. After marriage, communication completely disappeared. <laughs> so the baby Jesus begins to grow into being a small boy, and now he's thinking in God. But he's living with people that don't speak God. So he has to take cosmic transcendent thought and load it onto the boxcars of human vocabulary. The problem is what? The boxcars are insufficient for the weight of the thought. So he has to say words that people will understand, but, they're, but he's using them at two different levels. This shows up almost immediately at his bar mitzvah. Remember when they took him to Jerusalem for his bar mitzvah? And they accidentally left him behind. Remember? And they go back and find Jesus talking with the elders in the temple. 
And it says, and Mary and Joseph were wroth with him. They were angry. They said, you frightened us. We thought you were in the caravan. Why did you do this? And Jesus asked them a question. It's not complicated. Knew ye not I must be about my father's business? It's a simple question. Knew ye not I must be about my father's business? The next verse is brilliant. It says, and they knew not that which he spoke. (laughs) Why not? Why not? It's because he's using the words at two different levels. He says, look, I know that you know stuff. I know you know stuff cognitively, but don't you know anything? Dude, just live at the level of what you know. Can't you get up here and know things? And don't you know, I had to be about my father's business. Well, Joseph's my father, but he's not my father. He's just my father. I have a father. Well, he's not my father, but he's my father. And he has a business. Okay, okay. Joseph has a business, but it's just a business. I, I have a father who has a business. It's not a business, but it's a business. Don't you know this? And they knew not that which he spoke. For the rest of his ministry, every room Jesus leaves, everybody's asking two questions. Who was that? And what was he talking about? Sometimes it was an, a lot of people don't think stuff in the Bible's funny. funny. Some of it rips me up. So here's my favorite one. So Jesus is in a room full of Jewish people. It's packed. There's no room for anybody else. Philip and Andrew come to him, and they say there are two Greeks, Gentiles. There are two Gentiles at the door that want to come in and see you. Should we bring them in or not? And here's Jesus' answer. This is his answer. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot bring forth a great harvest. But if it falleth into the ground and dieth, it bringeth forth a great harvest. That's his answer. I can just see Philip and Andrew as they leave saying, do you think he meant like yes or no? (laughs) But the thing is, Jesus is saying, as long as I'm confined to the seed pod of this human body, how big a building can we build? But if I will go into the grave, if I will go into the ground and die to this body, then I can be raised as the worldwide body of Christ so that all the Gentiles forever will be able to step over the threshold into the commonwealth of Israel. But Philip and Andrew are only thinking of those Gentiles at that doorway. It's, it's over and over again. We've had 2,000 years to work with this stuff. But imagine hearing it for the first time. Imagine hearing it the first time. Let the dead bury the dead. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's going to (laughs) work. Sounds like a Stephen King novel, doesn't it? (laughs) The night the dead bury the dead. The problem is he's talking about life and death at two different levels. So he says, look, these people are dead. You're not dead. Those people over there. They think they're alive, but they're not alive. They're dead. Why don't you let those dead people bury these dead people? They're not dead, but they, they're dead. <laughs> and they knew not that which he spoke. <laughs> so in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus is carrying forward that same thought communication, that same conversation. He says, I am come that they might have life and that more abundant. You see the problem right off, don't you? He was talking to people that were alive. It wasn't in print. He was talking to people that were alive. I've come that you might have life. (laughs) Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Nobody in that room wasn't thinking, I'm like alive. (laughs) But Jesus is actually tapping back to a conversation between God and Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God said, you may eat of all the fruit in the garden except for the tree that's in the midst of the garden, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day in which thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. And the devil comes and he trades on the issue of communication. He says, did God say you would die? (laughs) He says, God, he does that. He doesn't mean you're not going to die. 
you will not die. And the woman took of the fruit and she did eat. And seeing that it was good to taste and good to open the eyes of one, she gave it to the man and the man did eat. Now here's my question. Did they eat that fruit and drop down dead? No, they didn't. God said, what hast thou done? They said, nothing. <laughs> they said, we ate the fruit and we didn't die. God said, trust me, you're dead. That whole issue is actually fundamental to the communication between God and humanity. Is what means life. I am come that you might have life. People said, well, I am alive. Jesus said, no, you're existing, but you are existing in a state of death. You are under the rule and domain and reign of death. You exist, yes, but you are not alive. For I am life and I can give life, but you're not alive. That is, that is fundamental to the whole understanding of Christianity. I'm come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. We know, we know what life means. Life means all the things that are about the life of Christ, the joy and the peace and the, the hope and the life, the faith, the purity, all that God, that's all life. And we know what death means. We're not confused. We may claim to be confused, but we're not confused. All the stuff that is about the existence of death, all the hurt and the hate and unforgiveness and racial prejudice and filth and murder and addiction and bondage, all of that is death. It's not, it's not a different kind of life. It's death. So two people appear to be alive, but one is alive in life and life abundant. The other is existing in death. And the death reigns over that life. Jesus says, I'm come that they might have life. And he can translate us from death into life. But to the outside, it looks the same. That's the reason that Christianity confuses people all the time. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. But he said that while he was alive. You see this, right? I am crucified with Christ. People said, no, you're not. He said, I am. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I. They said, it is you. He said, no, it's Christ who liveth in me. So that's, that's what we say. People say, are you dead or alive? And you say, okay, it's not that simple. <laughs> that's, that's the actual fundamental essence of Christianity. We've made it. We have made Christianity and getting saved so complicated and formulaic and contemporary evangelicalism. It's a miracle to me anybody finds God. It is, it is not what you believe it's not how you say it it's not how you pray it it is to receive the life which is him and from him I receive your life and I'm translated by life into life and that life becomes abundant full the fullness of life <laughs> life abundant not only is the word life confusing the word abundance is so you can have the little old woman who lives in a shoe and has so many children, she doesn't know what to do. And she can have life abundant. You can have another guy who's a billionaire and his life is the life of death and poverty. So it's abundant. It's life and it's life abundant. And somebody says, I am alive. And God says, no, see, you're not. I have abundance. No, he says, you are poor and blind and naked. God says, I want you to have life and life abundant. Not only that, life abundance, life abundant leads to life eternal. And the existence of life as death leads to death. Now, I'm not here to shock anybody, but listen to Dr. Mark. If you live long enough and Jesus tarries, every person in this room is going to die. Every person in this room is going to die. It is a physical reality. If Jesus lives on, everybody's going to die. When a baby is born, when a baby is born, from that moment on, that baby begins to die. But we, we can't grasp the transitions. We live confined. 
You take that little, you've been to the hospital with people who have newborn babies and you want to rejoice with them, right, Pastor? And they say, look at this baby. Isn't that the most beautiful baby you've ever seen? It looks to you like somebody hit it in the face with a hot iron. But, <laughs> but you say, oh, wow, that's a real baby. <laughs> but what you can never grasp is you hold that little baby in your arms and that sweet little Cupid mouth, you can't grasp that 15 years from now, that same mouth will sass you. <laughs> That's the transition of life. But when she's 15, she looks at her great grandmother who's dying and she cannot imagine the possibility that that will ever happen to her. I spent 16 years as a president of two different universities. So I was surrounded by young adults. And I, I love the little brats, but I mean, our beloved students. But young people not only think they're going to live forever, they think they're going to live forever young. They, they, they look at me, they look at old dude like me, and they say, OMG, what happened to him? And they cannot grasp that I ever looked like them. Because if they ever encounter the possibility that I once looked like them, the extrapolation of that reality is ooh, <laughs> unthinkable. So let's see, where's, where's a young man? How old are you, sport? How old? 15. Perfect. <laughs> Look right up here. Preachers all over the world today preaching good news, good news. I'm sick of it. I've, I've come to you with really bad news. Look up here. I am your future. As you are, so once was I. As I am, you soon will be. If you live long enough, son, you're going to look like this. But what happens is life begins to educate you. As you get older, you begin to receive the hammer blows of life on this physical self. You begin to sense stuff that you never, you never thought. And now suddenly stuff that never hurt you hurts you all the time. Stuff that used to work doesn't. Everything, it's just since this thing is going south. And you realize where it's headed is toward that physical reality that you never thought you'd encounter, and it's death. Every person here is headed toward that threshold, that doorway, a physical experience that we call death. If you live in life, if you live in life abundant, if you live in the life of Christ, then regardless of what happens, all those blows on this body that's chipping it away where you are able to escape that and step through you step through from life abundant into life eternal and you receive your glorified body a body which can live in life eternal this body can't live in that you got to receive a body that's right for that so you receive your glorified body see Christians are just like everybody else. We don't look particularly impressive. Some of us, a lot less impressive than others. But we don't look impressive. But here's the great scripture. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. So we're going to receive a glorified body. We step from life abundant through death into life eternal and receive our glorified bodies, which will not look like this. Do you think in heaven I'm going to be this short? <laughs> we receive our glorified bodies, which is suitable for life eternal, life abundant through death into life eternal. But if we live life in death, then death leads to death. We step through from the dominion of death through the same doorway. Christians and non-Christians step through the same doorway of death. We step through that doorway of death and into death. Death gives way to death. Life abundant gives way to life eternal. Eternal 
and everlasting are two words that Americans, most Westerners, by the way, that speak English, use them interchangeably. And they connect, but they're not the same. Everlasting means exactly what it says. It lasts forever. But the problem is, as it lasts forever, it may be subject to the laws of space and time. So it might last forever, just getting older and older and grayer and grayer. Maybe God is everlasting, but if he's only everlasting, maybe he's getting senile. Now we're in deep soup. But eternal means that it is everlasting, but that it is outside the ravages of space and time. So if it's everlasting for a million years, it is the same as it was the first second. Because it's not only everlasting, it's eternal. So God gives us life abundant. He gives us life everlasting. It'll never end. But here's the good news. It's life eternal. You ever hear people, people have goofy ideas about heaven. You ever hear people say, I hope they have pool tables in heaven, you know, or I hope we can do bass fishing in heaven, which, by the way, that one does have some attraction to me. But, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, it's because we have this goofy idea that we're going to float around in a cloud playing a harp. And you say, I'm, you know, I'll play a harp on a cloud for a thousand years. After a thousand years, we got to do something else. But th- that's because we don't understand eternal. The first split second as humans reckon time, when you step out of time and into eternity, the unspeakable bliss that you receive in that second, the unimaginable, unutterable glory, when you step out of space and time and into timeless eternity, that feeling that you receive that second never changes. It's not just life everlasting. That splendor, that glory is eternal. You are not going to get bored in heaven. That never changes. Well, let me bring this to a conclusion. You've been very patient. I was a 21-year-old boy. I was the associate pastor of an inner-city Methodist church. I was a Methodist minister for 20 years. I was an associate pastor of an inner city, very urban Methodist church. And the bishop of the North Georgia Conference, in his infinite wisdom, called me and asked if I'd like to be the lead pastor of a church in the country. And I said, yes. A 22-year-old boy should not be given a driver's license, let alone a church. I had no more idea than a goose what I was doing. One of the things that I had never experienced, which is a part of ministry... I had never experienced death. I had never seen anybody die. I had never seen a corpse. I'd never seen a dead body. I'd been at that church two or three months, and one of the wonderful men, we called him Uncle Charlie, everybody knew him, a saint of God if everyone lived. Been very healthy way into his 80s. He suddenly got sick, went in hospital, and he had a coma. And he was in that coma for weeks. He couldn't seem to die. He couldn't seem to wake up. It just lasted, and it drained the family financially emotionally physically so one night I said to them why don't you all go home I'll stay here all night I'll sit right by Charlie's bed you go home if anything happens I'll have the night nurse call you and they took me up on and went home sat by Charlie hadn't said a word hadn't moved a finger in weeks tubes down his nose needles in his arms everything and he began to make a strange noise in his throat and I called the nurse She said, oh, pastor, he's dying. She said, I'll call the family. And she left the room. And I was sitting there by Charlie. All of a sudden, he sat bolt upright in that hospital bed. It nearly scared the liver out of me. He just sat up in the bed like that. And he looked at a blank hospital wall and raised his arms and said, oh, beautiful. And he fell back down. He was dead when his head hit the pillow. And I realized Charlie had looked through the veil. He had seen the other side, and it should dispel for every Christian any fear of death. Of course, the transition itself, you're letting go of everything you have known in space and time, and you're stepping into something that you have only been hinted at and received by faith, which is timeless eternity, and that doorway is a little, you go, "Ah." it's like going over a waterfall in a barrel. The only thing is... You're going to land in splendor and beauty and glory. 
But I know the doorway is a little bit shocking. But there's nothing to be afraid of. If you have received life, you have no fear of death, and you have the promise of life eternal. Life gives way to life. Death gives way to death. This is all the choice of Christianity is. Choose life and live. There's no formula. It's just that. Lord, I receive your life. All that that life means now and all that that life will mean eternally. I receive your life. You don't have to talk God out of it. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and life more abundant. That's why I'm here. And all you have to say is, yes, Lord, I choose life.